So today, we're going to uh, start talking about the microbiome. And I, want, I always like starting with this quote. Um, so Louis Pasteur in 1885 believed that you could literally, um, if you deprived uh, a young animal of microorganisms, that animal cannot survive. So it was known, even the, or this early on, that you, like microbes were a part of living, of living animals. All right, so that they, it was a part of you, it was a part of every living thing, and without it, survival was actually thought to be impossible. Now, here's the interesting part about that. That's actually not true. Organisms without microbiota in them can survive. However, they have very exceptional nutri uh, nutrient and food quantity requirements. So if you don't have a microbiome, generally speaking, you need a lot more nutritional supplementation, you need a lot more food, and you, and even then, you're not going to survive well. So you're going to have a really abnormal body development. Like you're going to have stunted growth. You're going to have problems. All right. So it is possible to survive without a microbiota, but it's not easy. So it kind of uh, basically lets you know that the microbiome, which is uh, you know just the living organisms that live on you, are a big part of your regular development, regular physiology. Okay. So I want to start by defining what is the human microbiome. Microbiomes are basically micro, microbial communities found at different sites of the body. And they're classified, generally speaking, in, uh, in five different ones. There's your nasal, your oral, which you think they'd be, they'd be the same, but they're actually not. And we'll talk about the differences why. Um, the skin, which is obviously your largest or organ in your body, the gastrointestinal tract, and the urogenital tract, so your, uh, your uh, uh, you know, uh, vaginal canal, your urethra, stuff like that. Um, so there are about 10 times more microbial cells on and in you than there are cells of you. All right, just to give you the sense of scale here. And it, the microbiome is actually a huge source of, of, of genetic diversity and metabolic diversity in your body. So you know, we have around 20-some thousand to 30-some thousand genes, right? Um, the human microbe, think about it. it. It's thousands of species of different species of microbes. So each of them is going to have you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of genes themselves. So you're talking about millions of genes, of in, uh, different genes, in the human bi microbiome. So that's a lot of genetic diversity there, much more so than in actually human beings. Right? And that diversity is, is, uh, is at play. It affects you, affects um, how you interact with the environment. Right. Yes, Maddie. Yes. So most other organisms do have their own microbiome. All right. Any large, any animal will going to have its microbiome. Any, you can think about it, something as small as a, a nematode. So that's like one millimeter long. It ha itself has bacterial parasites that grow and interact with it. Mm hmm Very much so. And in fact, each bacteria, the bacteria themselves have bacteriophages, or viruses of them that feed on them. So it even goes down a, a, a scale further, right? So this is not just um, one scale, one order of magnitude. It's another order of magnitude right there. Yeah, it's an interesting thing about there. Questions? All right. So let, let's talk about what we're going to talk. Uh, the goals for today. So first off, I'm going to try to outline to you what a normal microbiome is. And I put that in air quotes because normal is really relative here. Um, the microbiome is diverse. It's diverse amongst different people, amongst different habitats. And we'll talk about a bit about that diversity. Okay? Then we're going to go into detail about the gut microbiome because it's um, I intimately related to, obviously, the previous lecture, the gastrointestinal tract. And also because we actually know a lot about the, the gut microbiome and how it affects nutrition, diseases, and, and, uh, and the various things. So it's probably as far as all the environments that your microbes could live in, it's probably the most well studied because it has such a profound effect on your diet, your nutrition, and all the diseases that can affect you in the gastrointestinal tract. Okay? And then we'll talk about some of the uh, uh, treatments and therapeutics that are available based on microbiotic treatments. Okay? So we'll just go into a few in detail, and we'll talk about, again, probiotics and prebiotics, what those are defined as, what you can, uh, how those are going to basically affect you. Okay, how you can get those, uh, what, what, what is a prebiotic and a probiotic. All right, so first off, how do you get 
microbiome in the first place? Well, first, you, um, most people get it at birth, either through the vaginal canal of your mother or through a C-section exposure to the air. That's your first microbiome. That's usually um, fairly, it's called a founder effect, right? The first contact is what's going to be the most diverse thing. However, that can change over time, right? Because you can think about it, you can change environments, you can change diet, and that's going to affect what microbes are on you or in you, generally speaking. Okay? Now, what is the kind of average readout of the mic microbes in healthy individuals? Well, there's this 2009 Costello et al. study. They basically took the microbiomes of uh, four uh, individuals, um, geographically, uh, geographically diverse, and they basically sequenced all the uh, 16S RNA of those microbes. And they find out what organisms, what general phyla of the organisms that broke down to. And it's broken down by you know, overall and then various locations, oral cavity, gut, skin, nostrils, hair on the head, the ear, uh, ear canal. And what they found was actually pretty interesting in the fact that in these four people, again, this is these four people, um, there are six phyla of microbes that comprise over 99% of all the bacterial, uh, the microbiome diversity in these, in these people, all right? And you can see that like it's, it's different, different places have different concentrations or percentages of microbes, micro, microbial species um, in, in those areas. Okay, so these are the six right here. And so what are these six uh, phyla of organisms? All right. So here is a 16S ribosomal RNA tree of basically all micro, uh, microbes, my, all bacteria. All right. So each of these branches is a phylum of bacteria. And each of these is ranged to a common ancestor. And each, the size of each of these branches is basically representative of the amount of um, the spread, the number of organisms or species that are comprised of that phylum. So you can see some are very big, like this proteobacteria is a really huge phylum, right? And others are very small. Right? Now, question for you guys: Why is uh, why would they be doing 16S ribosomal RNA? Why were they sequencing that? Yes. Right. So it's important in trans translation, right? Important to make proteins. Every organism will have it. Every bacteria will have it, and it's widely conserved. You need it to function. If it doesn't function, you don't function as an organism. All right, so it's a very well-conserved organism. But what they can do is like, they can sequence that, and you can get this kind of evolutionary divergence. All right, and we'll talk about how they actually uh, parse this into evolutionary divergence, the details of that, later on in the lecture. So again, you'll see that of, there's a lot of different phyla of bacteria here. Now I'm talking about the six particular ones that fall into the 99% of organisms that live in the human micro microbiome. First off, you have your actinobacteria. These are commonly uh, soil and water bacterium, and they're uh, commonly aerobic. Not a surprise that they're found on your skin and your hair, right? So that's where they're mostly commonly found. They, you encounter them through your interactions with the environment. If you swim in water, if you uh, have any dirt on you, you're gonna get these act actinobacteria on your skin and your hair. Okay, relatively harmless, usually not a problem. What's next? You also have your firmicutes. These are your fermenters, <coughs> generally speaking. These are bacteria most uh, commonly found in alcohol production of any sort, beer and wine. Um, and they uh, most commonly are found in your gut. But they do exist in small quantities elsewhere in your body. Okay? Makes sense. Yes? So yes, they are, they, they are some of them are anaerobic, some of them are can be aerobic, so they're not, it's not necessarily they have to be anaerobic. Now, I, I do think, and I might be wrong here, that in order, to, in order to ferment, they have to be anaerobic. But some of them can survive in aerobic conditions. All right. Now, your gut is relatively microaerobic, like very little oxygen there, so that's a good environment for them. Other questions? OK, what's next? Well, you also have this huge phyla called proteobacteria. This one is, is very, it's a very big phyla because it's like a lot of things, they share a few things in common. They are 
uh, mostly gram negative bacteria, so which means that they have double membrane layer, right? And it's not and the the outer layer is not uh, does not have peptidyl glycans on them, and they are generally um, it's very diverse. So some are things that you're familiar with, E. coli, Salmonella. Some of them are pathogenic. Others are these filamentous things right here. These are nitrogen fixers. They're also proteobacteria. So this is a fairly wide phylo that has a very loose grouping. There's actually, in fact, in proteobacteria, there's like alpha proteobacteria, beta proteobacteria, gamma proteobacteria. They're all, there's even sub phyla of these phylum. It's a very broad class of, 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 uh, of bacteria. And you have bacteriorities. Now these are exclusively anaerobic, gram-negative bacteria. And they're found primarily in your gut. That's all, and, and, but they don't have fermentation functions. So they're defined actually as negative fermentation. It's kind of a weird definition, right? And then you have your cyanobacterium. They exist in, again, um, they exist in nature. They're found in water. So if you, you know, swim, it's gonna get in your hair. If you, uh, you know, are in, uh, touch the soil in a way, some of it's gonna get in your skin. So again, these are skin and soil generally bacteria, but again, these are different from actinobacteria in the fact that they are um, aerobic and usually, uh, and usually autotrophic, all right? And then you finally have this interesting category. Uh, these are fusobacteria. Now these are bacterium that predominantly exist in your oral cavity, they're in your mouth, and in your mouth they're fine, usually, okay? But when they, if they escape from your mouth, they're actually pretty harmful to the rest of your body. Actually, a very interesting thought there. So um, they're usually, if they escape from your mouth, they can be involved in things like infections, and they can be involved in sepsis. So you know, like, if you ever heard stories of like crazy man bites somebody and they get an infection? Well, that's usually probably a fusobacteria that's infecting somebody because it's gotten into their blood, for example, okay? So it's weird, it's a, it's a bacterium that like loves living in your mouth. It's totally harmless in your mouth. Right, this this phyla, but when it gets elsewhere, it actually can be pathogenic. Yes. Generally speaking, yes. So there is a slight chance of that, but again, like your immune system is usually very good at taking care of that. Only like really the most pathogenic bacteria would be have, would have that be an issue. Yes. I don't know. They, I don't know, that's a good question. I would suspect that humans have developed your own antibodies towards these bacteria. So like maybe you can infect yourself, but it's easier to infect others. But I, don't, I really don't know about that as far as uh, how prevalent the like kind of antibodies for your own fusel bacteria are. Right? But even, so even though they are like uh, considered a part, like they're known to be in your mouth, if you look at where they are as far as percentage in your oral cavity, it's pretty still a pretty lowest percentage. You're talking like less than 10% of the species diversity is in your oral cavity. Now that's again, much greater than anywhere else in your body, right? But you can see here, like again, like now that you've known, your gut is mostly fermenters and bacteroides, right? But then your, um, but then like your skin and nostrils, your hair and your head, definitely has a lot of actinobacteria. There's even some cyanobacteria in your skin, right? So that there's, the diversity makes sense given the functions of these, uh, or what these organisms do. Okay. So, any questions so far? Now I say this is a normal microbiome, and again, air quotes, because the variation is really high amongst organisms. So these, this is the kind of um, diversity if you look at each of the four separate people that they've done the study on. And they, this is the diversity on different days even. So you'll see person A, one day, second day, person B, one day, second day. You can see there's a lot of variation here, right? The amount of phylogenetic makeup of one phyla versus another is very um, variable, highly variable, right? So what we, we saw in the previous slide is an average, but in reality there's a lot of variation. So let's talk about a little bit of that variation. First off, I wanna to talk to you guys about how you define phylogenetic diversity, all right? So again, they're, they're taking 16S RNA, sequencing it, and then trying to figure out, okay, how closely related are all these 16S RNA, uh, ribosome RNA sequences to each other, right? 
So this is an example of, of how you would kind of parse that. If you take the D sequences, which is the sequences you get from your sequencing, you want to just figure out, OK, how many mutations do I need to make to, to have them be the same? Right? And you can see that these two, are, and you can computationally figure this out. You can write scripts and things on MATLAB to do this even if you really wanted to. Um, you, could, you, uh, you can see that these two are one base pair change away from each other. Right? But then these two are one base pair change from each other. But then this is considered one, two, three steps away from these. Right? So like that, that's how you kind of figure out phylogenetic diversity. And that relates to basically, and this is how you kind of figure out branching, how different sequences are related, how closely or distantly related these sequences are to each other. Makes a lot of sense, right? I hope. Any questions on this? So how does this actual figuring out sequence diversity go into something we call defined as unifrac distance? Unifrac distance is, is basically defined as if you compare two sets of people's microbiomes, how much overlap is there, right? So for example, if you have complete overlap, two, mic two sets of microbiomes are exactly the same, that's unifrac distance of zero, right? If you have related sequence sets such that maybe um, they only diverge in maybe one or two sections, that increases your unifrac distance, right? But then if you have two microbiomes that completely are divergent, right, there's no con uh, connecting, connecting branches, that's a unifrac distance of one, all right? So that's a measure of how variable two separate microbiomes are from each other, right? So the higher it is, the more, the, the more different the species of those microbiomes are from each other. Yes? This takes into account just species, because what you're doing is sampling, right? You're not, you can't take every single microbiome and just grow all of it out, right? So these are all samples of, of species. So this is not talking about the amount of each bacteria living in your body. We still don't have a way to really accurately counting that. What this is, what is, this is taking account into is the relative genetic diversity of what's in your body. Okay, so you can just sample a bunch of sequences and hopefully get a good spectrum of, of genetic diversity. Okay, so this is not a, a measure of amount, it's a measure of just genetic diversity. So how does this relate to microbiome variation? Well, if you look at the differences in, within habitats and people, you see there's still a lot, there's a lot of variation right, within a habitat, but it's diff, very different with, between habitats. Same thing with people. Variation within people, there's much more variation between people. Now, variation within time, that's actually really interesting. Um, you're not, there's not less variation in a same person at different times, right? So what that means is usually if you are consistent in your diet, consistent in your environment, you're probably not going to change your microbiome a ton over time. The only major changes to your microbiome will occur if you change your environment, if you change your diet, okay? And so most of these people had same the same environment, the same diet for the change differences in months that, that they did before and after. They, they did sampling. Okay? So that's an interesting thought. Now, what about microbiome variation in different parts of your body? So this is fairly interesting. There's a lot of variation outside of your body, within and amongst people. That makes sense, right? You're, you're encountering different environments every day, different organisms will get on you, on the skin and your hair, right? Look at this, that's interesting. So there's less variation in your gut between people, I'm sorry, uh, within a person than between a person, right? There's a lot more gut variation between people than within a single person. I think that. And there's relatively very little variation in your oral cavity, either within or between people. Now, why would you think that is? Why, is, why do you think that would be an issue? Uh, that would be an interesting observation, or why would what, what would explain that observation? Yes. There's yes, you can pass saliva. What else is there? Ever? Could possibly be. Hmm? 
Okay, yeah, that's, a, that's another idea, right? But the thing is, like, you're also, your mouth is open to the environment a lot, right? You're also drinking water, you're introducing new foods, the foods themselves have microbes on them, right? So, possibly, but that's, yes? Mm -hmm. Possibly, yeah. So again, like all these are potential answers. I don't have an answer for you here, but um, what I think, and this is again my opinion only, um, is that you think about what you subject your mouth to on a daily basis. It's a fairly harsh environment compared to the rest of your body. So you're brushing it, you're introducing new foods to it, you're drinking sodas and you know juices that have really low pH, right? So there's massive changes in the dryness and wetness of your environment, the pH of your, uh, I'm sorry, the dryness and wetness of your mouth, the pH of your mouth, the um, aerobic or anaerobicness of your mouth at a specific time. So as far as environments go, it's probably one of the most variable environments in your body. Everything else is pretty home homeostatic, right? Like your skin needs to be a certain temperature, your internal organs need to be a certain temperature to function correctly, that kind of thing. Your mouth is widely variable. And that, I think that kind of harsh variability, again, my opinion only, is what's really selective for only a few species can really survive in that kind of harsh environment. Again, that's my hypothesis. I don't know if there's actually, there's a lot of studies proving that, but it'd be interesting to kind of think, kind of think about. All right? Yes, Maya. Mm -hmm. So unless you shower with micro, uh, antimicrobial soap, you, all you're doing really is just moving your microbes around you. You're actually not getting rid of that many microbes. Most microbes are resistant to soaps and detergent. And so even though you might wash off some of it, there's probably enough to like repopulate it fairly quickly. And also, there's think about it, there's even a microbiome on your soap, things to live on your soap. So, um, and actually that's one of the things like my antimicrobial things, um, tend to, if, if you see, really disrupt your microbiome. So that's actually something that we'll, we'll discuss in a little bit. Other questions? Not that you shouldn't bathe. Bathing's good for you. But just it doesn't really have a ton of effect on your microbiome. Okay? Now, this is a study that was done in 2009 of four people over the course of a month. All right? Obviously, it's not really that comprehensive. So starting in about 2002, What's been done, going on in the United States is something called the Human Microbiome Project. So this is the natural extension of the Human Genome Project, right? We sequence the human genome, we have all the genes in there. Well, the problem with that is that it's really only half the story, right? Because you also need to figure out what are the, all the microbes that are living in the human and how they interact with, with us, right? So there's been a, a project underway. They have about 300 subjects enrolled where they're going to sequence um, not only the 16S RNAs of all these organisms, but they're also going to um, sample a whole bunch of different body sites on each of these people and sequence the, the phylogenetic diversity there. Now, just to get a sense of what's going on with a whole lot of people, so you can get a sense of what a microbiome is. Yes? Mix? I think sampling is a very interesting, like so part of that is like statistically they have to like sample enough to get what they determine genetic diversity. Right, right. And it's also people who are willing to sign up for this, right? Because like if you agree to this, you have to agree to not change your environment or your diet too much in the number, in the time that you're doing the study, right? So it, you have to actually enroll willing volunteers. So I think it, it, it's a blend of scientific, like you need X number of people for statistical significance or sampling size. And then, up, and then also, who can you actually sign up practically, right? So 300 might be what they wanted. Maybe they wanted 400 and only got 300. I don't exactly know why that is. I bet you that this paper would probably give you a bit more detail uh, of, of the methodology they came. Because so this is a paper about the methodology of all this. Obviously, the results are forthcoming, right? This has uh, been going on for about a year and a half at this point. Right? Any questions? All right, so let's do a real quick part here. So let's do some testing, testing of yourself. Um, can you see that? All right. So where do you think you're sterile at? And where do you think you're not sterile at in, of these five things?
All right. We got everybody yet? Close, close. Guys, do we have 20 people today, or are we, uh, how many people do we have in here? All right, that should be enough. All right, we'll say this is good. And we'll go from here. All right. So, ooh, okay. So this is the results. Answer four, vaginal fluid. Yeah, that's true. So um, if you have bacteria in your blood, that's sepsis. That's a really dangerous condition. Um, so your body will like totally go haywire when that happens. So you probably, that's uh, very unsafe. Um, again, your urine, this is interesting. Your urine is actually, because it comes out of your, um, of your uh, deeper in your body than just your like, um, uh, urethra, thank you. Um, it itself is sterile. The kind of opening of your urethra is not, but the urine itself is sterile when it comes out of your body. Out there. Um, yeah. Questions on this? So we continue. Okay. So let's move on. Oh, yeah. And if you have bacteria in your cerebral spinal fluid, that could cause. Um, that's a cause of actually like um, psychological effects. So if you have depression or dementia, one of the things they check for is bacterial bacteria in your cerebral spinal fluid. So that's something to think about. All right. Um, I, my, I have no idea. That could be interesting. I actually have no idea what bacteria would go there. Usually through the blood. Yeah. So these are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, any other questions? All right, so let's switch our focus a bit to the gut microbiome. We're talking about a bit about the nutrition, why your microbiome is really important for you to survive and be a healthy, normal, uh, functioning uh, organism, and the diseases that could affect it that are microbiome-based. Now, some of these have other, can have potential other causes, but they also have causes that stem from your microbiome. Okay? Okay, first off, your GI tract has is basically populated with about a thousand species of microbes. Okay, um, the, obviously there's variations in the amounts. There's more in your small intestines and colons and less in your stomach for obvious reasons. The fact that your stomach is a very low pH means very few organisms can actually survive in that compared to uh, things in your small intestine or your colon. All right, um, but it's really important for a lot of things. It's it uh, helps you produce a lot of micronutrients. It also However, it can be harmful for you because it also produces a lot of toxins. All right, these, um, and we'll talk about a bit of both. So first off, micronutrients. Your bacteria and your body are responsible for producing a few, a, um, your B vitamins and your K vitamins. Okay, they're responsible for taking your food and basically throughout whatever process they're doing. So if you're taking like vitamins B, uh, you want you know things like meats eggs, dairy, your body can't actually process the products of these foods naturally. It takes your microbiome to process these into the B vitamins that you will then absorb. Okay, same thing for K vitamins. Uh, your microbiome helps mature the K vitamins, again, processing the K vitamins. And K vitamins, again, are involved in these processes. Uh, mostly a lot of blood, clotting, a lot of vascularization, stuff like that. Um, your microbiome also enables more iron to be absorbed. All right, so a lot of it is generating um, iron into, I think it's ferrous or ferric. So it gets converting one to the other. I don't remember off the top of my head which one is which, but your body is more readily absorbent of, um, I think it's ferrous iron, but I'm not 100% sure. But it basically converts one, one of the irons into another form of iron that's more readily absorbable, uh, absorbable by your small intestine. Other things, your body is also, uh, your microbiome also produces short chain fatty acids. So this is the byproduct of if you have plant polysaccharides that themselves are not absorbable by you, but they are processable by your microbiome. So they, 
produce things that generally affect your intestinal epithelial health. All right, so they prevent um, um, prevent uh, inflammation in your intestine, and they also increase the kind of uh, mucosal barrier in your intestine. And also, again, they regulate T cell levels here. That's again also an, an, uh, promotes intestinal barrier health. All right, so these are things that are from products of plant polysaccharides that you can't absorb, but the microbiome does, and then it produces as its waste product these short chain fatty acids that, you're, that really help your body out. What other things does it do? Um, it also produces chorogenic acids. So these are things that are basically antioxidants, help you lower your blood pressure. Again, from, from uh, things that are, not, that are naturally not absorbable by you, Microbes take that, produce these chorogenic acids, which are absorbable by you, and use um, as antioxidants in your body. Now, your body also releases bile acids, right? This is from the endocrine lecture that's involved in a lot of things, right? They um, regulate endocrine function, promote fat processing. Um, but it's one bile, it's, it's, your bile acids are naturally produced in your body, are one form. In order for it to regulate many different things, your microbiome has to actually process it through various different ways, the ox uh, oxidation, deconjugation, whatever processes that can actually affect the molecular structure of this. And different isoforms of processed bio acids regulate different things in your body. All right. Questions? All right, so I talked a little bit about nutrition. We'll talk about the diseases. So this is usually what happens uh, due to one of two things, either non-naturally occurring organisms getting into your microbiome and disrupting it, or um, maybe overgrowth of a natural part of your microbiome due to some health disruption. And overgrowth might produce, say, an, overgrowth, uh, an overproduction of a certain toxin which might affect you. Those are the, usually the general two mechanisms that microbiomes have of causing disease in you. So it's either invasion by a foreign microbe that doesn't normally uh, belong in your body, or overgrowth of a particular microbe. Yes, Maya. Yes, that happens a lot, actually. So we'll talk about that. So what are some good and bad microbes? So we have just here a listing of microbes that are considered really healthy for you. And these are things that are included in probiotics, so things that you can find in yogurts and cheeses and stuff. And these are uh, a list of microbes that are considered bad for you. Now, this is an interesting list because E. coli is a natural part of your body. Actually, you have E. coli in your gut right now. Okay, It itself is. The, most strains of E. coli are benign. The lab strain we have in lab, you could probably drink that. It won't hurt you. Not that I advise you to do it. It tastes awful. But there are pathogenic versions of each of, each of these organisms. And we'll talk about a particularly variant form of E. coli that actually has a really bad effect on, uh, on your body when, they, when it gets in your body. Okay. So first off, what are some of the really famous ones? Well. Um, this one's very famous. This one's called Helobacter pylori. This one is uh, the major cause of ulcers in your body. All right, so it's mostly dormant, but it thrives in your stomach. And how it does that is that it, so most organisms can't live in the really low pH of your stomach, right? This one will because it produces um, uh, urease and it releases it so that the environment around it is less acidic. So it, it, it basically increases the pH from like say below one to like two or three, which is enough for it to survive in your stomach. Um, the problem with when it does that, however, is that it also, that also causes that micro basic environment or microalkaline environment will also cause your stomach lining to wear, wear away over time. And that's what's the production of ulcers in your stomach. This can also res uh, result in ulcers um, elsewhere, um, such as your upper intestine. Okay. Now, this is fairly easily treatable. Something like Pepto-Bismol will work because it does basically protect your stomach lining. So like, you know, I've seen the commercials of Pepto-Bismol, it you know, coats your stomach. Yeah, that's exactly what it's doing. It's coating your stomach so that your, uh, the ulcers that are formed aren't being exposed to the gastric acid. So the, the pain you feel from ulcers 
is because the stomach lining is wearing away, and then the acid comes and damages the cells underneath the, the, the stomach lining. Yes. So, I don't know, actually. That's a good question. I don't think so. But what ends up happening is that eventually, like, I think the bacteria go, will be, can go away on your own. Now, if you really want to treat it, you can use antibiotics. That obviously has its, has its minuses, and we'll talk about that later. So it's not something that you do unless it's a really serious, like, chronic or really serious gastric ulcers or ulcers in general. All right? Now, some of the epidemiology, this is something that really affects a lot of the world. Um, less common in the Western world, but very common in, um, in, in, in the developing world because it um, can be found in, in drinking water. All right, so something about if you don't have clean drinking water, you might get this. Um, and interesting, this is weird. It affects African Americans and Hispanics more than the US. I have no idea why this is. Interesting. All right. Yes, Maddie? So if you drink more basic drinks, what you're doing is actually increasing the pH of your stomach temporarily, and that could give an opportunistic organism like this, which is mostly dormant, a chance to, a chance to thrive. So basic drinks, um, coffee, you have milk in it, for example. Anything that's milk is actually pretty, a basic drink. All right. <laughs> yeah, stress ulcers, I'm not sure. They're, they're definitely not helobacteric pellet clause. No, 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 it has nothing to do with bacteria, this bacteria. Again, there are stress ulcers. I, I don't know if there's a, a good link between the, what caused the stress ulcers. Any other questions about Helobacteria pylori? Yes. Yeah, um, generally, yes. So they, I'm not sure if Helobacteria is one of those organisms that can sporulate. Um, but I do know that they can, be, they can basically exist without being in, uh, infectious or virulent for, for a long time in an environment. So that's why this is very common in, in developing worlds, is that you can get it. It'll be dormant, and then only when you say do like they say your your immune system's weakened, or you do something that makes your stomach go a little bit basic, is it going to just activate and thrive? Right. So I don't know exactly how it goes dormant, but I do know that it, it can stay in your stomach for a long time. If you really want to clear it, antibiotics is probably the best way. But treating your body with antibiotics also comes with some potential side effects, which we'll discuss um, because it really what it antibiotics are really non-selective. They will kill everything in your microbiome, in your gut, when you take them. So that's not a good thing if you think about what could happen afterwards. And we'll talk a little bit about that, especially when we talk about Clostridium uh, difficile, which is a very common um, opportunistic infection when you take antibiotics. Other questions? All right, moving on. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, again, E. coli. This is an organism that can be virulent. And we'll talk about certain strains of E. coli that will actually do that. And we'll talk about one really common one. But what I want to show you is this little video, which actually il really illustrates how and why E. coli, um, when it's virulent, can be really bad for you. So here's our bacterium here. And behind it will be these long strands that are the bundle forming pillows. They're going to adhere to the microvilli, these wiener like structures. This is what your normal intestinal cell surface. So this is your microvilli, here. right? Bacterium then causes these things to disappear. It then starts to nestle down on the surface. It's locked in. So what's this thing and doing immediately that's really bad for your intestine? And it's going to set up camp right there. Yeah, it's destroying you know your microvilli, right? Because we can see this in electron micrographs, and the microvilli all disappear, and boom. OK, so we're now stuck in the intestine. Bacteria are here. We're going to zoom in. Here's our type 3 secretion system, right? Um, this thing will poke out. We know protein comes out. We know this protein. And then it inserts two more proteins that come out and down this tube, and they go in to insert into the host membrane. 
So these green proteins will sort of form like a donut pore, and this is kind of the tip of the syringe. Then we have to fire in the receptor, the tear molecule, and you'll see it as this red molecule coming down the chutes, and it gets then fired into the host cell. And then it goes into the host cell. We don't know if it goes through the cytoplasm, it goes straight into the membrane, we haven't figured this out. You'll see a little blue dot. That's a tyrosine phosphorylation event. Tear gets modified, then it ends up in the host membrane. So here we're piling the receptor into the host cell. And then, we then have to dock tear with intimate. So we think this tube-like protein retracts, and what will that then do is bring the bacteria down into contact. Here's intimate up here, blue tear here. Houston, we have contact. We have now landed. Bacteria is stuck on this cell. And now we're going to go inside the cell, and we're going to start to see this, the space of tear that's facing. It recruits cytoskeletal proteins and these little um, donut-shaped things we are starting to understand more. Then you're going to see little yellow beads come flying in. These are actin monomers. They then get together, and much like a string of pearls, they polymerize. These things flying in, they then start to get longer and longer, and actin does this for a living. It forms these long, project, these long projections, strings of beads. And what that will start to do is start to force, put a force on this thing, and you will then start to see the bacteria actually raise up on the cell. And it's because this actin pushing underneath it that it actually pushes it up into the cell. There it goes. And then it starts to push up. Bacteria starts to raise up. It's now building its throne. And I'm going to sit up on top of this thing and rule out over it. So why it. is it doing that? And if this doesn't want to make it be a microbiologist, I don't know what will. Isn't this a thing of beauty? And then it just continues to rise and rise and rise. And the end result is we then end up with the bacteria sitting up on this throne, shall we say, to rule out over the mammalian cell, and that's what we see in disease. Okay, so what are some takeaways from that video? Thoughts? So what, okay, so for me, two things jump out. Okay, what, what are the two things that you can almost see immediately that if you have a virulent E. coli infection is going to do to your, to your stomach lining or to your intestinal lining? Go ahead, Michael, what's the other thing? Yeah, see that huge bump that it's doing, right? So th the reason why it's doing that is that the E. coli wants to get into the middle of your intestinal tract so it can absorb your micronutrients, right? So that's how it's going to feed. So like, it needs to physically want to be out there. So it's going to cause all these like juts, for lack of a better word, um, into your, from your intestine. A lot of swelling, a lot of inflammation, not good for your intestine, right? So again, most E. coli aren't like this. But I will talk about one that actually is very much like this. Um, so this is um, the O157H7 strain of E. coli. This is actually probably a, one of the most virulent um, E. coli out there, so much so that we actually keep track of outbreaks um, that, are that are caused by this particular strain of E. coli. All right, You might be familiar with it from this. This is a 2006 spinach outbreak, which had um, a few deaths, a lot of people infected, and a lot of uh, crop damage. All right, so this was found in spinach, and it caused a lot of, uh, lot of uh, losses, both of, of uh, life, time, and money. And so this is a particularly harmful strain. So they've started keeping track of it in 1982. And you'll see that this has really increased in number of outbreaks over the years. Now, some of that is. Um, to the fact that actually we are seeing a, number, a rapid number of outbreaks. Some of this also could be that more people are reporting it over time, right? So it's not something that was very reported, but like people are more aware that this is out there now, so we're getting reported more. What's really interesting about this is that you see a, most, the majority of these are foodborne. And of the foodborne, you can see down here, a lot of this is from ground beef, right? That's, why, and now, why would ground beef be a really easy source of, uh, of this particular strain of E. coli? Being virulent. Ready? Hmm? Well, why not other beef, though? Why not? Right? Yeah? Possibly, yes, yeah, some of it is. Any other, any other thoughts? Steven, yeah? Bingo. 
right? So if you have one cow that has uh, uh, E. coli infection, right, it's going to be spread out to many different packages of ground beef. When you're cutting like you know a part of a cow that's whole, it's usually from a single animal. So that's a big difference. Like that's how somewhat, so this is somewhat a comment on the industrialization of food. When you mix meats from different batches, that's kind of become much more widespread. Okay. Yes. Twenty. Increased surface area, right? So that's true. Mm -hmm. That's very true. So increased surface area is is, is a is when you ground the wheat, right? The the E. coli can then get mixed into the surface area. E. coli is usually going to be in the outside of your uh, of, of your meat. Right? Now this is something again. Um, if you cook your meat well, you will not have this problem. Like you will not have this infection. But if you undercook your meat or if you like your steaks rare or something like that, that could be a problem. You might get this. It's very rare, but you've seen the number of outbreaks. Um, this is only tracking to 2002. One thing I can say is I've, looked, I've seen data from past this to current. It's actually actually stabilized and gone down. So this was a fairly acute thing in the early 2000s. And it's something that actually has basically stabilized. And it's actually not as big of a problem as it used to be. I think we've, uh, the food regulations got a lot better, but it does exist. You will, you may encounter it. Questions? Yes. Right. Yeah, vegetables are, are a less common uh, source of that, mainly because again, these these uh, opportunistic E. coli infections stem from from usually cattle. Um, it's usually from, uh, from the fecal matter of cattle. So the odds of getting fecal matter of cattle on your spinach or your other fresh vegetables, um, obviously cooking your vegetables will also help uh, reduce the outbreak because that will kill the bacteria. But um, as far as, like they just, usually the, uh, for fruit safety and fresh vegetables, they tell you to wash everything thoroughly and that will help. It doesn't really uh, completely eliminate the risk. Nothing will, but you know. So you look at the number of outbreaks every year, we're talking 40 or 50 a year. It's actually dropped. It's probably around like 20, 25 now. Yes, Maddie? Yeah, I was just going to say that the number of outbreaks hmm? is like constant. Yeah, so I would recommend that you definitely wash your vegetables thoroughly. Okay, yeah, that'll help. And uh, not sh yeah, anyway. All right, any questions? Yes? Wash your milk with the microbes. If you wash with hot water, actually it'll kill some of the microbes. So that actually, so that's the real thing. If you want to wash, wash with hot water. That will tend to help a little bit better. It's not going to prevent, like, completely eliminate it, but it will reduce the risk. Questions? Okay, yes? So yes, uh, which is something we're going to focus about. There are antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, that that is true. It's uh, MRSA is a very common one. For example, I think it's that's. Get the what's the acronym for MRSA? What does it stand for? Right. So it's a staph bacteria that's resistant to methicillin, which is like the most powerful antibiotic we currently have right now. So if you have MS uh, MSRA, you have MRSA, you have a problem. Um, most E. coli and other things aren't at that stage, but it is a problem that we, um, this is kind of like microbial arms race, right? Like there are pathogenic bacteria, we develop antibiotics to kill them, they evolve resistance, we have to develop power, more powerful antibiotics. And so this is actually an opportunity uh, for bioengineers to think about because we are reaching the point where the uh, evolutionary ability of microbes that are harmful to humans is slowly but surely outpacing our ability to generate new, more powerful antibiotics. So there's gotta be a better way to, uh, to kind of treat these things. And we'll discuss at the end of this lecture kind of some ways that current bioengineers are exploring to treat, uh, to treat things in, without using antibiotics. Okay. Now, one reason antibiotics, again, are bad for you is that they clear out your microbiome, right? So like right now, when you have something like E. coli or have something like H. pylori, your, the treatment, optimal treatment is usually to take antibiotics. Antibiotics are very indiscriminate. They'll kill everything that's not resistant to it, right? And that, is a problem 
especially because um, in hospital environments. So if you get treated with antibiotics in a hospital, you, um, you'd think that would be a, a good thing. But one of the leading uh, kind of bacterial infections you find in hospitals is this organism called, called Clostridium, Clostridium difficile. Okay? I'm not sure if you've heard of it. If you ever work in a hospital, you will hear of it because it's actually a big deal um, in the sense that there's a lot of people in hospitals undergoing antibiotic treatment. Right? So they get their entire GI system cleared out of a lot of organisms. This allows opportunistic infection because there's nothing else there to prevent uh, opportunistic organisms to grow in that, in that area. All right? C. difficile is very prevalent in hospitals because it forms spores, and spores that can last a long time. So it's around hospital settings all the time. And what's really interesting about that is that, like earlier, you can get C. difficile from a perfectly healthy person. They walk in the door, they have C. difficile on them, but it's in spore form, and they themselves have a healthy microbiome. So it's not going to it's not going to um, germinate and colonize, right? And it can get passed from person to person, doctored to nurse, nurse to a random person, janitor, janitor to patient, whatever, right? And as long as those people are healthy, them themselves, they can carry those spores, but they won't develop the disease. It's only when they encounter somebody that has, um, are, are currently undergoing antibiotic treatment and say they don't have anything in their gut. It's an, opt it's an opportunistic colonizer. So they colonize the gut, and that's going to create a host of um, intestinal problems, a lot of diarrhea, a lot of uh, just illness, and you'll just feel sick. Um, you're just, just, like, just a lot of stomach illness based on this organism. Now, whenever I'm in a building, especially in a hospital, one thing I tend to look at is actually, um, this is really interesting, the doorknob. So if you look at a doorknob now, what do you think it's made of? Stainless steel, right? Okay. It, the doorknobs are actually a very easy source of transmission of something like C. difficile. All right? Now, when you look at an old-timey hospital, this is an interesting thought. What do you think of when you think of doorknobs there? Brass, right? So it's really interesting because brass, what, what's the primary ingredient in brass? Copper, right? A lot of microorganisms don't tolerate copper that well. So actually, a brass doorknob is much more antimicrobial than a stainless steel doorknob. However, Current hospitals will use stainless steel. Why is that? Looks better, cheaper. Brass tarnishes over time. It looks more dirty, like looks dirtier, even though it's actually better at being antimicrobial. Interesting thought. So if you ever, like I always do this when I like go into a new building, I always look at the doorknob. It's like, okay, do I really want to touch it? If it's brass, I'm like, okay, I can touch it without a problem. Because honestly, microbes don't last more than a few minutes on a brass door. Microbes can last for hours on a stainless steel door. Because just, just my, um, stainless steel is, tends to be iron. Organisms can live on iron much longer than they can live on copper. Just an interesting antidote. All right, other diseases. We'll have to move a little faster here. Um, first off, um, microbes are, are involved in obesity. So this is a study done on mice. And you find that mice, they take, um, germ-free mice, and they colonize them with, my, with the microbiome of either a lean mouse or a healthy mouse. And you find that there's actually different effects to, depending on the microbiome. And in fact, these, these um, uh, germ-free mice, if depending on the microbiomes that get colonized by, become lean or fat. And so it really has a big effect. And you can see that like having, uh, being colonized by microbiomes of obese mice tend to lead to increased acetate and butyrate production, Decreased amount of energy consumed, or uh, of, of energy metabolized, right? So they're just less active, and uh, the increase in body fat percentage. Look at that, right? So you, you're gonna get some increase in body fat percentage because you're just more efficient um, at processing food when you have a microbiome than when you're not, right? But if you have obese mouth, look how much body fat you you retain. Yes. Again, we, we we're still there's are still thoughts and hypotheses as towards why. Other diseases. But meat is bad for you because of the gut microbiome. So there is this uh, chemical called TMAO, which is directly associated with, uh, with heart disease. All right, you have this chemical, you're more increased risk of plaque buildup, more increased risk of heart disease. Um, you can't, it, it, it is um, from 
these two original chemicals found in meat, choline and carnitine, or, or yeah, carnitine. However, these chemicals are not processed um, into TMAO unless you have the gut flora that are able to do so, right? And what's very interesting about that is that they took a bunch of vegans and omnivores and they actually did this kind of study for them. They had them eat a steak, measure the, the carotene levels, they suppressed their gut flora using antibiotics, had them eat another steak, look at their carotene levels, and then reacquired their, their bacteria and then add another steak. Fun study, huh? Yeah? Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, so, how long does it take to It's actually a good question. I actually don't know the timing of that is. I do know that if you do something like gut floor suppression, just take antibiotics, you'll just clear it out immediately. So that's like a, like almost like a reset button. Okay. That's true. So like, again, and I'll show you the results here. Um, they basically, again, this is a measure of the TMAO levels of these various people. So again, here, uh, with your microbiota, with your microbiota suppressed, and then with the microbiota reacquired. Right? This is for the average person. And then what they found is, again, omnivores compared to vegans, this is the amount of TMAO you get over time, the 24-hour time period. So omnivores will, will get more TMAO and have increased risk of heart disease compared to vegans because they have the mic microbiota that would process the meat in, from carnitine into TMAO. And you see this again in the urine levels of the of people as well. And what's interesting is that what this means is, um, and they did this kind of comparison, you are two and a half times more likely to, uh, two to two and a half times more likely to have uh, heart disease if you have, um, if you have high carotene, high TMAO levels. And this is uh, mostly associated with TMAO because if you can have high carotene and low TMAO levels, so you can actually, if you don't have the microbiota that can process the carotene to TMAO, you're not going to be at risk with heart disease. But you acquire that from eating meat over time. I don't know how much time it takes, but it does take some time. Okay. Um, okay there are a few other diseases. I think we're going to uh, see. So these are two diseases I want to talk about real quick that have both microbial and non-microbial sources. Of potential. So this one is called, uh, this is two versions of inf uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. This one's Crohn's disease. It can affect any part of your gastrointestinal tract after your stomach. And um, it can be from microbi uh, microbiome infection. And so this, but it could also be from an immune response. All right. And this is a chronic condition. It just basically causes a lot of inflammation. And so the way to treat this is usually antibiotics to try to kill off anything that could be causing this uh, problem if it's not an immune response, and anti-inflammatory drugs. It's when it's treated, it's, it's pretty chronic, though. Um, the other version of inflammatory bowel disease is ulcerative col colitis. Now, this one is all about higher levels of sulfate-reducing bacteria in your, in your body. So if you have an imbalance of that, you're going to have higher levels of high hydrogen sul sulfide, and that's going to cause inflammation. Now, whereas Crohn's disease can be all over the place, ulcerative colitis is, uh, colitis is mostly in your colon. So there's, there's a solution to that in that if you really have a severe case of this, you can just have a colorectomy, take out your colon. Um, however, most people will take, again, anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressant drugs to try to get rid of this. Because the other cause of this that's non-microbial is, um, is an autoimmune uh, immune disorder. Okay? And in fact, um, here's an anti-inflammatory drug that actually uses the natural gut flora because it's inactive until it reaches your, your uh, gut. And then there's microbes that will actually process it into its active form. So there's an anti-inflammatory that actually utilizes microbiota to do that. Okay, we're going to skip this little test yourself because I want to talk about some treatments and therapeutics, and then we'll get quickly to the uh, case study. All right, first off, one way to fight Clostridium difficile is actually to do a fecal transplantation. Remember, it's it's something that's an opportun opportunistic colonizer, right? It requires that there's no bacteria, no other bacteria in your gut to colonize. Well, what if you could? transplant your bacteria back into your gut. Sounds like a good idea, right? You bring this up to patients, this is their reaction. Yeah, right? Doesn't it sound like a good idea, right? 
So it, it theoretically sounds great, but getting patients to adopt this is actually not easy. However, they've done some pilot studies on this, and they found actually it's very effective, more effective, in fact, than the current treatment, which is this drug. That you, if you recolonize with your donor fecal bacteria, like you can actually prevent Clostridium difficile much more effectively than with the current state of treatment. So this is something that's a pilot program. And in fact, it's gotten to the point where the FDA is, has issued a guidance that's saying that this could be used to treat C. difficile. This will be only at the, with the agreement of the doctor and the patient that they're going to try this. So very experimental, but something that you could use as a treatment against C. difficile inf infections in hospitals. Interesting thought there. Now the question is, currently, what you're doing right now is, is basically taking the um, sample from a person and then putting it back in the person. So when it's healthy, putting it back. The question is, can you say maybe do something like um, healthy fecal bank, right? So you can use a microbiome from somebody else. Can you preserve your particular thing when you're healthy, right? And then put it back later. So you can save your own, your own fecal sample if you want to do something like that. So there's thoughts about that, okay? All right, moving on, last part. We're gonna talk about pro probiotics and prebiotics, okay? Probiotics are actually defined as microbes. These are microbes that have to meet these five conditions, all right? They're not gonna be uh, harmful for you, non-pathogenic, non non-toxic. It survives in your gut, so it needs to be able to go through your gut and survive. It doesn't have to be stay, stay in your gut a long time, it's only an hour or two tops, but it needs to survive that journey. Again, it, returns, it retains viability during Storage. You can put it in food, you can put it in yogurt. So it's usually found in things like milks, cheeses, yogurts, and stuff. And it will still be viable once it gets in your gut, right? And has a beneficial effect in your body. And it tastes good in food. Obviously, if you put something, a microbe, in a food and it tastes, makes the food taste awful, you're not going to want to use it, right? And what are these things usually? These are usually, again, the lactobacteria and phytobacteria. Those are the two things that we said, uh, these are geniuses of organisms that are tend to be good for you. And they, again, usually suppress pathogen growth because they uh, caught, mimic what you are good bacteria in your body, and they improve intestinal barrier function. Those are probiotics. So those are microbes that have those qualities. What's a prebiotic? Prebiotic is a food ingredient. It itself is a food ingredient that actually promotes probiotic growth in your body. So you can think of things like um, vegetables, whole grains, things that are not absorbed by your gastrointestine, but are food and fermentation products of your microbiota. All right, so if you eat whole grains, if you eat uh, fruits and vegetables that have a lot of cellulose, those are things that your body won't absorb, but the microbes will. And it'll promote healthy, uh, healthy microbiome in your body. Okay? And again, this is something that's an emerging field in bioengineering where you can reprogram microbes that would exist in your mi natural microbiome to have additional functions. Here's an example of one where you basically maybe use benign E. coli and have it sense a pathogenic um, infection, such as the pseudomonas infection, right? You can just have it sense it, go to the infection, and then release things that would maybe destroy the biofilm and destroy the cells themselves. So this is a potential thing that's currently uh, under study. And this is the paper that reflects that. So there's current studies of thinking about engineering your microbiome to actually maybe fight disease or fight specific infections and, or having purposes in addition to what this naturally does. All right? Okay. One quick one, we'll go to the case study, okay? Actually, I think I lost it, so we're just gonna skip that. All right, sorry. All right, so let's, let's go to the case study. James, just go ahead. Oh, the answer is the three. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So case study day two. Um, great job, you guys, on the differential diagnosis. These were some of the top diagnoses that your groups came up with. Um, so thinking about the fact that her symptom, the patient symptoms, as you remember, is 49-year-old lady, premenopausal with kind of fainting, dizziness, uh, lightheadedness and a really low hemoglobin count, so definitely anemic. And so she could be bleeding from somewhere. Um, so you guys mentioned the GI tract. You also mentioned the liver, which helps um, make your body's coagulation factors. So she does drink quite a bit, but not super huge amounts. So the kind of normal limit for binge drinking in females is two, two standard drinks per day. So she's kind of at that borderline. Maybe she's been drinking for a long time, so perhaps 
he is not as able to create the coagulation factors that stop bleeding. Um, iron deficiency um, from different causes, such as nutritional deficiency, could cause anemia over a long period of time. So it doesn't necessarily explain why acutely she has been deteriorating over the past few months. Um, Hypopituitarism is relatively rare, but could explain some of the symptoms that she presented with, and we didn't really have that much information to go on. So definitely something to consider if there were other things, if all of the more common causes didn't pan out. Um, we also mentioned that she um, noted kind of heavy periods, so certainly menorrhagia is a very common um, cause of anemia in women, but again, that would be more of a chronic issue over time. And uh, you guys mentioned things which could cause menorrhagia, like endometriosis and endometrial cancer. Um, but endometrial cancer is more something that you would worry about um, in a postmenopausal woman if they have vaginal bleeding. So here are some additional tests um, that we did. Uh, an electrocardiogram showing that her heart rhythm was normal. Pelvic exam didn't find any issues with her. Um, reproductive system and there wasn't any evidence of bleeding there and no masses that could be felt on exam. Um, iron studies showed a deficiency in iron, but that doesn't really tell you whether it's a nutritional deficiency or whether she's bleeding so much that um, the iron's being used up by the body by trying to re um, reproduce the red blood cells. Um, a coagulation time, so those three tests help determine whether you have the appropriate coagulation factors, and that's a marker of whether your liver is functioning properly, and so all of those tests were normal too. Um, some of you proposed um, doing a fecal occult blood test, which detects whether there is blood in the stool, and so that came back positive. So this suggests that somewhere in the GI tract there is bleeding. And so a lot of you guys thought this because, again, she is taking the ibuprofen. She has a history, a family history of peptic ulcers, um, and their things, and the alcohol consumption. All of those things may contribute to um, potential development of something in the GI tract. So we did some additional testing. Um, you guys recommended endoscopy, which is ab absolutely appropriate. So EGD, the upper endoscopy, can look for ulcers in the uh, stomach and the duodenum, but um, you also want to do a colonoscopy because some of you mentioned the possibility of colon cancer or other um, things which could be bleeding in the colon. However, um, both of these exams were normal, but um, yeah, so both of those didn't show any ulcerations or uh, polyps in the colon that might suggest um, what is going on. However, given the fact that um, you know we have this hemocult test, um, we'll say that we repeated it and it was still positive, and this lady is anemic, like severely so, with a hemoglobin of seven, it's still most likely that something in her GI tract is bleeding. And so for day two, we'd like you to come up with um, different either additional diagnostic tests or um, treatments based on the diagnosis for a GI bleed somewhere in the GI tract, which you have yet to identify. Um, yeah, sorry I went through that very quickly, but this is for the recording. So if you guys have questions, um, I can clarify things now. So I guess there's two things here. One, you're going to want to treat that bleed wherever it is right now because you need to stabilize the patient. If, if they really are, really are anemic, that's probably um, something that's not good for her long-term health. Um, the other thing you want to do is really, you know, you know it's in the GI tract, you just can't see it. Where, how are you going to be able to find it? That's the ultimate. The, so you have to address kind of the symptoms of this patient so that she's not going to get worse, right? But also, how are you actually going to find and, and cure whatever she has? Yep. So in the pre previous lecture, in the GI lecture, we did discuss a few of these tests. And one of the different things in this specific assignment is we would like you to think about what's more or less invasive. Um, because it's, you know, a lot of you guys propose biopsies of the liver and biopsy of this. Those aren't trivial. 
because in order to stick a needle in someone and take cells from someone, you're introducing that risk of infection, bleeding, um, other causes. So you wouldn't subject a person to every single test under the sun because you think there's a possibility that that might be the cause. Um, so, you know, endoscopy is relatively minimally invasive and ha does carry some risks, but it's commonly done because you want to treat something that might um, lead to the patient's death imminently. So um, that's why we tolerate those kinds of risks. But in considering the different diagnostic and therapeutic modalities we have right now, it is important to think, okay, well, what is more or less invasive? Like the fecal occult blood stool test, very non-invasive. You just take patient's stool, smear it on the card, and then it tells you. But, you know, um, other things which you will discuss in the assignment may be much more invasive, um, but may be the definitive treatment or diagnostic test that you have to run.